As we get into the Word of God this morning, how many are ready to hear something? Okay, I hope that, I hope that we are. Anyhow, I want to say right from the beginning, and uh, I almost feel like we have to make this statement in the face of the enemy this morning because of everything that we've experienced this week with the passing of loved ones, Charlene passing and gone to be with the Lord. Um, we could many times look at that as defeat, and I'm, I'm sure there's some of us are going, man, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. Why, God, why, God, why? Let me tell you today, God is still a God that does miracles. And let me say it again, God is still a God that does miracles. God is a miracle-working God. Amen? He is a miracle-working God. Uh, maybe with what we have seen in our life, it has caused us at times in our life to question or doubt, is God still in the miracle business? I, I want to assure you that he is today. Maybe it doesn't always work out the way we want it to work out. Maybe it doesn't always work out the way we prefer that it would work out. But let me tell you something today, that God is still doing miracles. God is still working out things in our life. We may not always be aware of it. We may not always see what's happening, but we are assured in Romans 8, 28, that God is working out all things for good to those who love him and for those who are called according to his purpose. Can you say ouch or amen today? We don't always see it though because God works behind the scenes. My mom got me this book way back when I first started ministry and it was entitled God Works the Midnight Shift. I am grateful for that because I don't like to work the midnight shift. Anybody with me on that? I'm, I, you know, I might stay up till midnight, but it ain't much past that, and I'm not much good at that point. Are you with me? I'm not the only one, right? Um, but here's the fact of the matter, is that God is working behind the scenes when we aren't, is the point. When we're at rest, God is awake and he is moving and doing things that we don't even see, we don't even understand. And there's two things that we have to remember that God is doing in every circumstance in your life. And can I say everything? And yes, the answer is everything. God will work all things, and all includes what? Everything, right? So in every circumstance, God is working out two things in our life. Number one is our good. He is always working out our good. How? I have no clue. When? <laughs> I have no clue because it's his time, not our time. But he's also working out a second thing that he is always careful to take care of, and that is that he would be glorified in the situation. God is always doing those two things in our lives, through our lives, and with our lives. So he's not just trying to take good care of you, but he is always looking for an opportunity to bring about glory to his name. Do you believe that today? So when we go through the things that we go through, when we face the stuff that we face, we ask ourselves a lot of questions and we ask God a lot of questions. Maybe it sounds a little bit like, God, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Or why aren't you doing this? Or how are you going to work this out? Or where are you in the midst of this stuff, God? Why is this happening to me? What did I do? And I just want to challenge us today, and myself included in this very thing, that we're, there may be opportunity, there may be a, a dire need for us to change our thinking, to shift our patterns of thinking when it comes to situations like this. Maybe it means a change in our attitude. Maybe it means a change in our viewpoint. Maybe a change in our biblical worldview to some degree as well. To change our responses that come our way. Church, as the body of Christ, we are the blood-bought, we are the redeemed, right? We have to come to a place that there are occasions in our life we aren't always saying, God, why, Lord, me? Why, why, God? And we have to say, God, what are you trying to do in me? Or God, I'm entrusting my life into your hands. And I know it's not easy to make that kind of change, to make that transition. There's a lot of pride in us. There's a lot of ambition in us. Many times there's things we want to go to and it seems that what is happening in our life is taking us away from where we'd rather go. How many know what I'm talking about today? But we have to trust God in these things. Sometimes we need to Simply put down the questions and instead walk in the grace that God gives us to walk in. 
Paul had his own issue. His issue was this thorn in the flesh that he would bring to God over and again and say, God, take this thorn from me. How many remember? Take this from me. And God gave him an answer. And it wasn't yes. And it wasn't necessarily wait. It was this word that most of the time we, we understand, we know, but we don't really like. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you, didn't he? And my power is perfected in your weakness. And there's times in our life we have to simply endure what God has allowed to come into our paths of life, and we need to walk in the mighty grace of God. And maybe that is your word today. If you gather nothing else, maybe that's what you need to hear this morning, is that we need to walk through the stuff that we're going through with the grace of God and allow God's power to be perfected in our weakness because God is able to sustain us and to bring us through. Can you say amen? So today, if we need a title for the message, as we look at John chapter 9, the title is simply No More Blame Game. No more blame game. And I want to just kind of approach this idea today about the questions and the doubts that we have and that God is calling us to settle on the fact that he is indeed working out all things for our good and for his glory so that he can be glorified in the situation. Let's read the word of God together. John chapter 9, verse 1. It says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said this, he spat on the ground, made clay out of the spittle, and applied the clay to his eyes. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and he washed and he came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, no, 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 I'm the one. So they were saying to him, how then is it that your eyes were open? And he answered, the man who was called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received my sight. Let's pray. Father. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today to worship you, to celebrate your goodness. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that in these moments that we share together right here, right now, Lord, that you would speak into our hearts and our lives. I pray that you would challenge us, but Lord, change us as well. Help us, Lord, to surrender. Help us, Lord, to allow you to do what you do best in our lives and be glorified. And I ask in the name of Jesus in these few moments, God, with my feeble words, that you would add your anointing and your blessing. Let us hear what you would say in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, that you would shape us more into the image that you have for us. We ask in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen and amen. The question, Rabbi, who sinned? Who was wrong here? Was it his mom and dad? Did he do something bad? Is it his fault? Why is this guy born blind? Question after question after question. How many have had some questions for God? You, you've asked God all kinds of questions, uh, questions about the things that are going on in your life, maybe questions about the things that are happening in your children's lives or your family's life, maybe questions about what's happening in the world and why is this happening? Why this God? Why that? Why him? Why her? Why not him instead of me? Why me, Lord? And questions fill our hearts and our minds. Why did this have to happen to him? Why is this happening to me when I've done everything right? Why do I deserve this? 
And I'm not here this morning to tell you that you're wrong if you've asked questions. I'm not here to say that it's wrong to ask the Lord questions. I think it's great that if we have a problem, we go to God with that problem, that we express that frustration or that hurt to God. Don't misunderstand me today. I'm not saying you're wrong if you've ever had questions, but I'm here to tell you as well that Jesus sees you right where you're at and he understands what you're going through. He knows exactly what's happening in your life. More than that, he knows what you need in this moment. He knows what you need and how you feel and where you're going. And better still, I believe with all my heart for as bad as things can get in the world and with all the tragedy that seems to befall so many of us, what can happen in each circumstance is that God can use it as an opportunity to display his power, his goodness, his love, and his mercy if we only would allow him to do so. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for God. It's a chance for him to break through and get some glory. After all, he desires to display his works before all the world so that they can see his goodness on this earth. He is looking for opportunities to let his power be seen through our lives so that others will glorify his name. He's looking for an opportunity to manifest his presence through somebody, and that somebody is you. As we think about Charlene for just a moment, if I can use her for the example today, that was her greatest desire in the midst of all the garbage that she went through with her health. She just wanted to see that God would be glorified through her life. And I'm not saying she was perfect, but from what I saw, it looked pretty good to me. None of us would want to go through what she went through. None of us would want to face and hear those words, that word cancer. And have to make decisions on treatments and this and that and the other thing. But I do know over and over again, especially on Wednesday nights in Bible study, she would repeat those words that I consider it all joy. Well, when life is going good, it's easy to say that, isn't it? But life wasn't perfect for her at that moment. And yet, she took those words from James chapter 1 and held them dear to her heart. So this is how I'm going to do this. This is how I'm going to approach this. This is how I'm going to walk through this thing, that I'm going to consider this all joy. And let God be glorified in my life. And I want to tell you something. As she did that, God was able to get some glory through her life. And I dare would say this, that as God would allow us to change our thinking and shift our thinking to say, I'm going to consider it all joy, that even though I don't like the circumstance I'm in, even though I don't enjoy what's happening in my life right now, or what in the natural we could say might happen in our life, God, I'm going to trust you to work this out in my life. And God, that you would get the glory and that you would get the praise. We can rejoice with Charlene today because she didn't shake her fist at God that I'd ever seen. She didn't curse God. And I'm not here to, to you know, blow her up. Please don't misunderstand me. It just seemed to collide that this message and her passing. And, but it's a great illustration to us as her church family and her dear friends that she let God get the glory through it. And you know, I said to somebody earlier this morning before service, now let's carry on that legacy that she left behind. Let's follow that example because she sits in what we call from the book of Hebrews this great cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on today, saying you can do it, you can make it. We're going to see God get the glory and the praise. He is in control. You may not feel like he's in control. You may not like what's going on, but he's working out all things for good and he will be glorified in the situation if you'll allow him. Just count it all joy, James chapter 1. Friends, that's what God is asking us to do and asking us to understand. And when we're facing things like that, we sometimes need to fall back on this famous passage of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Why? Because our understanding is messed up 99% of the time. Isn't that true? 
we rarely see clearly because we are emotionally bound up with the thing. We're going through this stuff. We don't know how to handle this stuff. So our emotions are geared up and tensed up. But in all our ways, in every circumstance, we could say acknowledge him, and then he can make our paths straight. This is one of those verses that we can fall back on in our life and understand that we don't always understand. Instead, and because of, we trust. We don't trust our understanding, we trust that he understands. We trust in him because he know, we know that he is working out all things for our good. We acknowledge that he's going to work out his best here one way or the other, and we wait for him. Now, it may not always work out the way you want it to work out. Isn't that true? But yet, God calls us to trust in him and lean on his understanding. And I know it's easier said than done. Believe me, I have to do it just like you do. But it's still something God calls us to do. So I want to go back to our text here today and pull out a few thoughts for us. Number one thought I want us to hear as we look at our text is in verse 1 of our text. It says, and as he passed by, speaking of Jesus, Jesus saw a blind man from birth. We want to talk about the agony of painful experiences here for just a moment. This guy that is highlighted here in this text is a blind man, and he's the one that captures Jesus' attention. What is so unique here is that this guy is the only blind guy that we hear of in the Gospels that is said of him that he was born blind, he was blind from birth. Verse 8 tells us that he is found sitting by the roadside just simply begging there. And we have to understand in this unique situation... Maybe just the crowd saw him, wayside crowds are there, but yet in the midst of the crowd, there is this one guy there begging, which is unique. Maybe in our city, you might be able to easily identify one guy standing there begging because he's got a cardboard sign in his spot. But if you've been some other places outside of the U.S., and people are just crowded around the streets like in different countries. I know when I've been to a place like uh, the Dominican or Cuba, there's just people everywhere. There's clusters of people, but yet Jesus was able to kind of zero in on this one guy in the crowd. Again, we see this in the Gospels all the time. It seems to be this one guy in the crowd, and this one guy in the crowd captures Jesus' attention, and he's begging there. And what's sad is that he is regarded more as a nuisance within the general public than anything else. And he is just seen as somebody there that maybe isn't really contributing a whole lot in life or to the community and seen more as a taker rather than a giver. The bottom line fact is most people, I would assume, never assume that anything's going to change for him. He's always going to be there. He's always been there. And that's just the way the life is in our community. Here's this blind guy begging. And you know what? Jesus knew better. Jesus didn't just see it that way because though he's always been there, he doesn't always have to be there. And you might say, well, I've always been here. I've always been in this situation. It's just the way it is for me. This is just my lot in life. This is just the thing I have to carry. With Jesus, it doesn't have to be that way. All things are possible with God. We must never lose heart we must never quit chasing this thought that God can heal me, that God can touch me. I know we get sometimes sicknesses that come upon us and we're just like, okay, this is just the way it is. I'm, I'm going to have diabetes. That's just my thing. That's just my deal. I, I would say continue to ask God to touch you. Continue to come to the altars when the altars are open and say, God, I want to be touched by you because nothing is impossible with God. The Bible tells us to be persistent in our prayers that way. The Bible says to keep being that little one that knocks on the door. Be that persistent one to get the judge to finally say, okay, enough is enough. Give her what she wants and get her off my back. That's what God wants us to do. But we get okay with where we're at. Nothing is impossible with God. And Jesus sees this blind guy, a guy from birth, sitting there begging, and he's been there begging a long time, 
And he knows something can happen in this blind guy's life. The crowds are hanging around him. Uh, Somebody just blended into the landscape. But Jesus noticed this one out of many. And while everybody else saw this guy as a person who just was being judged by God for his sins, maybe judged by God for his parents' sins, maybe he's in that situation for something bad he did because who sinned here, God? Was it him? Was it his parents? He was being judged. That's kind of the idea in the mentality of society at that time, that that was his problem and he had to bear his weight because of his issue in his life. Jesus, though, viewed him as somebody that needed a gift of healing in his life and that things could be completely different. They didn't have to stay that way. Jesus knew what was happening on the inside of this guy. Jesus knew what could happen in his life. And you know what, friends? Jesus knows what's happening on inside your life as well. He knows the weight you're carrying. He knows the weight you're bearing. He sees the struggles that you wrestle with. He hears the groans of why me, Lord. He sees the frustrations. He understands why. And he's looking for an opportunity. He's waiting for an opportunity. You know, there's an there's old song that says, No, not one. That says, Jesus knows all about your troubles. He is with us to the very end. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows what you need. First Chronicles 28, 9 says, For the Lord searches the hearts, and he understands every intent of thoughts. He knows where you're at today. You might say, well, I'm just one that's sitting here in a crowd of people. No, but he still knows what you're facing. That should be a comfort to our hearts today. That should be encouragement for us today. Because you're not just a number and you're not just another pretty face in the crowd. But he knows what you need today. Can you say amen? Which leads me to my second thought I want to share with us. The asking of the disciples. Verse 2. The disciples say to Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned here? This man or his parents that he is born blind. They asked what many of us would maybe think if we lived back in those days. What's wrong here? Jesus, who sinned? Did this guy get it wrong? Why is he in the circumstance? And if we're really not cautious, I think sometimes there are some of us that see people go through difficulties in life and we say, well, we put it like this. They made their bed, now they have to lay in it. Have you ever said that? Basically saying, hey, You did something wrong, now you got to pay the price. And to some degree, there's truth in that. And that's kind of the idea, the attitude of some of the people here. What's going on with this guy? Whatever it is, it's just he's paying penance for it with being blind in his situation. And maybe there's some of us that are sitting here today and we're going, why did this happen to me? Whose fault is this? Did I do something wrong? We ask God those kinds of questions. When we get in a real pinch, what did I do wrong, God? Did I offend you? Did I upset God? Has anybody ever asked that kind of question? Maybe not out loud. And we know God is not a God of vengeance, but there's still a little piece of us that goes, hey, God, have you forgotten about me? Have I done something that has caused you to turn yourself away from me? We get to feeling like that. We go through these things and we begin to wonder. But we've got to understand that it's bigger than a statement like this. You know, there's a statement I found that says, the secret to success is knowing who to blame for your failures. That's kind of the world's mentality, isn't it? That's the secret to success. Always have a fall guy. And, and many in business work that way. In politics, it's always seeming like a head's rolling someplace for whatever reason. But that's not the way it is in the kingdom. That doesn't work with God. Because instead of finding fault and laying blame on somebody else, we've got to remember that we now have a chance to see God's glory revealed in us. You might be going through a really difficult thing. This is not happening to you so that your life can be terrible, so that your life can be horrible, that you can curse God and die like Job was told to do, right? God could be setting you up for an opportunity to let him be glorified in your life. That's what we want to see happen. That's what God wants to do. The disciples asked, who sinned here? And this was a very popular doctrine back in the day that was known as retributive justice. Retributive justice here is this thinking that every pain in life, every difficulty, every struggle, 
Every problem, each affliction, every disappointment, every heartache that you have is connected to something that you've done wrong before. That God is going to get you. I grew up with that mentality. I kept hearing that. If you do something wrong, he's going to get you. I had this little image in my mind that God has got like little lightning bolts and he's kind of, little Tony over there, he's, I'm, get him right there. And I grew up with this idea that God is going to get me. How many grew up with that kind of thing? There was this sense. Or if you don't behave, the devil's going to get you. How many of you remember, ever heard that one? The devil I always had this picture of the devil's just going to kind of come up through the floor with his pitchfork and get me and take me down and roast me over a fire. I did. As a little kid, that was kind of the feeling that I grew up with. That is not God whatsoever. That's not how God operates. That's not what God is doing here. But this was the idea that the disciples had, and they were in this little blame game conference here. This idea that this is a blame game. This is the wise, and we played that game. Is it my fault? Is it your fault? What have I done? What have you done to do to me? And why I'm in this situation, now what in the world is going to happen? We see it happen all, all the time. Gideon asked this question of the Lord. In Judges chapter 6, verse 13, Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? You know, God is with you, great man of valor. Well, if he's with us, why am I in this situation? Again, kind of this question, this doubt. Bildad said to Job in Job 8, 6, If you're pure and upright, surely now he would rouse himself for you and restore your righteous estate. Kind of along the ideas, if you're such a good guy, Job, then God would have certainly fixed this and gotten you out of the situation by now. So maybe the inference is you're not so good like you thought you were. Hmm? Remember when Paul got bit by the snake, he was just trying to stoke the fire after a shipwreck? And a snake came out and bit him on the hand. What did the islanders do? Oh, that guy's a bad guy. That's why God allowed the snake to come out and bite him on the hand. Now we'll just watch him swell up and die. That is in the scripture. I mean, he didn't say it that way. I think if you read the message, it might say it that way, but it's not in the King James or something like that. But that's their, that's their idea. God's going to get him because he deserved to get bit. If you like the message, I'm sorry. I was just kind of fooling there. But we blame things. We, we look for reasons. We try to rationalize this stuff. It's not at all what's happening here. If that were the case, as we read Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, it says, although he was a son, now this is speaking of Jesus. He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Now understanding Jesus is without sin. Let's get that out of the way. He never sinned. He wasn't bad. But he did learn some things in his life through the suffering in which he endured. And that's to remind us of the very fact that just because we endure suffering doesn't mean we're bad people or we have sinned and offended God and now he's getting back at us. It's an opportunity for us to learn. It's an opportunity for God to work out good in our life. It's an opportunity for God to be glorified through us. You follow me this morning? This making any sense at all? And if there's, this is so true about Jesus, and obviously Jesus didn't sin, his father didn't sin, but yet he endured scourging and even death on the cross. Then sometimes the stuff we go through in life is just stuff we go through in life. And there's nobody to blame except that we are just walking through this course of life by the grace of God, and he will bring us through it. Do you follow me today? We need to get beyond asking these games of blaming somebody else. I was fired from my job. Whose fault is that? Did I do something wrong? Did somebody else? My mom served the Lord all her life, died with cancer. Why'd she die? These are questions I've heard from believers. My spouse was unfaithful, betrayed our wedding vows. Whose fault is that? My children know better. Still, they resist God. What's the deal? I've been lied to and rejected by people. What's the deal with that? Why is that happening? I love the Lord and serve him, and yet I'm sick. I still have this 
problem in my body. Bad things seem to be happening to good people. Why is this happening, Pastor? Why do we see stories about missionaries that die in martyrdom when they're taking the gospel to others? Leads me to this next thought, the answer from Jesus. Why does Jesus say all these questions with all these questions that are coming to him? What does he say? Look at verse 3. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. Basically, Jesus rebukes this idea that sin has caused man's illness. He rebukes them in this inference that sin caused this guy's blindness. He rebukes the idea for us as well that you and I are using this or that or the other thing, blaming it on somebody or ourselves or God. He rebukes that thought that this has come to us by him because of. You follow me today? He rebukes the idea of us trying to find all the answers and the causes. The disciples are still troubled. Then there's no rationale in our circumstances in life. We're only victims of fate. Maybe this is what's going through their minds. Are we supposed to just live and let live then? Do we just face whatever comes our way? Listen to me. Hear the resolve to these questions. Jesus didn't feel this man's condition was the cause or caused by questions of discussion. He saw this man's condition as a place to take action, not to place accusation. And your life and the stuff you go through is not a place to place accusation against yourself or somebody else. It's a place we want to see God take action and be glorified. They asked all these questions. Listen, they asked all these questions about this blind guy. And Jesus says, look, we're not going to sit here and slice and dice this and try to figure out why and what happened here. This is just now a time for me to do something. It's time for... Jesus to bring glory to himself. It's time for a miracle to happen. And you know what, friends? Sometimes we've got to get past the accusations and trying to figure out all the stuff that's going on, all the minutia that gets us bogged down with so much stuff, and just say, God, take action in my life. Begin to work in my situation. It isn't about that his parents sinned or that he even sinned that caused the blindness. This happened for a few very specific reasons. Number one, it was in order that the Son of God might be displayed in him. If you look at verse 3, this is what Jesus says. It was so that God, that the works of God might be displayed in him. Why is he blind? So that Jesus could be glorified. Why am I going through what I go through? So that God can be glorified in your life. Why is this happening to me? Why did this circumstance come to me? It's so that God can be glorified in your life. It doesn't mean he's going to necessarily change the situation, put it back to what we think is perfect, but he can be glorified in it somehow and in some way in the way that he works it out. Do you believe that today? That's what he's talking about here, that God's power would be exercised, that God's power would be displayed. And you see, God has already arranged it, that he would meet this need and God's power would be revealed in him and God's power can be revealed in us as well. That's what God wants to do in the situations that we're facing. Number two, he goes on in verse four. He says, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day, because night is coming when no man can work. And here's what Jesus is trying to teach now his disciples. Listen, that we see these things that prop up and crop up in the midst of our life. We pass by the blind guy. We pass by the lame person. We see a sick person. God is saying there's work that needs to be done while it is day. And we can't forget that as we encounter people with need in their life, it is an opportunity for God to use us. Because Jesus understood one thing. He was here on this earth to certainly do a few specific things. But in this instance, listen, he was there to let the light of God shine. Now Jesus is gone. We know that he commissioned his disciples. Now the disciples are gone. And who's left? And now it is in our hands that God would use us to display the works of him who sent us. 
who sends us. There's situations in people's life that we know about, things that they're facing, things that they're going through, and God is saying to us today through this scripture that he has sent us out for such a cause as this. That we would pray for the sick, that we would love the lonely, that we would care for the widows and the orphans. Do you hear me this morning? That God is trying to motivate the body of Christ with this thought. Why is this happening? Why do we see this blind guy in the Bible story here? Why are we reading it this morning? It's a reminder to us, not just that if we have problems and questions that God's gonna work it out, but it's also a reminder to us that God wants to do something with us to speak into that situation and to love on that person and to see God bring them through it and be glorified in their life. He has anointed you. He has gifted you with his power. I don't know that I feel like that might be bouncing off a little bit, but I hope you're hearing that today because God has commissioned us to go and do the work of the kingdom. And the other thing that is there that Jesus says in the very next verse is he talks about being the light of the world. And we certainly read of those verses in other times. Can we go back one more slide, please? Jesus said, while I'm in the world, verse 5, I am the light of the world. We know basic physics of life, right? If we turn the lights off in here, what's going to happen? It will be dark, right? It will get dark. But as soon as we flip that switch and the light bulbs turn back on, what happens? It gets light. And the darkness, hey, we're great today. You're a great scientist. Um, here's the thing. Darkness has no victory over light. It has no ability to overcome the light unless the light itself is taken away or is, is diminished then darkness comes back. But in every circumstance, darkness has to flee. And Jesus says, while I'm here, I am the light. I have to be the light. And now Jesus calls us, we can look at other places in the scripture that says, you are the light of the world. You are to be that city set on a hill, not hiding it under a bushel, but putting it out. Kind of like that song we sang is, children, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And Jesus says, hey, you are the light now. You've been commissioned to demonstrate and to share the light of Jesus Christ. And as you do, what happens to the works of the enemy? Darkness has to flee. It can't remain. As we let Jesus shine through us and we are his light, guess what? The light shines and the enemy's works are diminished. That's why we can pray with confidence that God can indeed heal. He does still do miracles. We still believe that God wants to save sinners, heal the saints, bless people, deliver them. Can you say amen? Ouch, is this new concept to us? I mean, help me out here today. But it all comes down to this. Let's realize it's an opportunity for God. Let's realize this is an opportunity for God. The stuff that we want to see happen the last thing, and I'll wrap this up real quickly here, is the anointing of the eyes. Verse 6, it says here that Jesus did something unusual. He spits on the ground, he makes mud with the clay, and he rubs the mud into this blind guy's eyes. He didn't see it coming. He couldn't have flinched, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm thinking, who's going to sit there and let somebody rub mud in their eyes? But Jesus rubs his, this mud in the eyes of this guy. And what's interesting is that this guy is not healed at that moment. You would think, hey, holy spit, mud, rub it in his eyes. Well, that isn't how it happened. That isn't what took place. Because Jesus put mud in his eyes and then tells him to find his way to this little place called Salome and go wash in the water there. Blind guy. It's kind of humorous to me. I'm sorry, it's just kind of humorous to me. Put mud in his eyes. He's already blind. Now he's got mud on his eyes. He's got to find his way to this place that he... But God stirred something up in this young man. And it's called faith, hope, expectation. 
and then required of him that he would follow through on this so that healing would come into his life. Certainly, Jesus could have laid hands on him and said, you're well. But he allowed this gentleman to couple his faith that was stirred up with him with his action. To go through and follow through on what needed to be followed through on. Go find this pool and wash in it. And after you do that, then you will be made whole. Why did Jesus cover up what he wanted to open up? Because he wanted to stir something up in this gentleman that needed to be stirred up. And I believe God wants to stir up within us what needs to be stirred up. And that is that hope, that expectation, that faith once again that God is more than able. And my greatest fear as a pastor in a church when we lose a dear loved one that we have prayed for and we've prayed for for years and we've trusted God for years and we've said, God, you're more than able. And then it doesn't turn out the way we want it to turn out that we lose that faith, that we lose that hope, that we lose that expectation. Hmm? Let's not allow our feelings to betray us. Let's remain hopeful, faithful. Let's continue to trust God that he will indeed still heal the sick. That he will indeed still do mighty acts and glorify his name on this earth. You hear me this morning? Because I have had some of us, some of you, or just part of the family, why is it we've prayed and it still hasn't happened? Well, God will be glorified in many different ways, not always in the way that we see best fit. And the truth is, friends, that it is still appointed unto man to die, then the judgment. I'm going to talk today about Lazarus. Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb, but here's the fact. Lazarus is not still around today. He still died. He still had to make that transition. But it doesn't diminish any more the power of God than if Jesus never brought him out the first time. You with me today? Friends, let's keep our faith, our hope, our expectation stirred up. Missy, you want to come to the piano for me, please. Let's keep that stirred up today. And let's be willing ourselves to take those steps of faith, to walk in obedience, to see God having an opportunity for glorifying his name in the midst of our situation. Let's stop asking whose fault is this, friends. What we do many times when we get caught up in difficulties and struggles is we keep our, our communication going this way, laterally. It's more horizontal. When this thing is vertical, this is about us and God, and God, what are you doing? This is a conversation that involves the Lord. The issue is all about who wants to manifest his power in our life so that we can see him bring hope and be glorified in our life once again. Jesus made this statement. This is not that he sinned. It's not that his parents sinned, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. This is what God wants to do in your life and in my life, to display his power and his glory in our lives. So I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what you maybe are asking God, God, why God, why God, why do you allow this? Today, I do believe that God wants to display his glory in your life with the circumstance you're facing. So heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's realize Jesus just wants to be glorified in me. Is there something you're going through today? And you've asked God the questions and you've wondered about the circumstance and said, why God? Is it a situation that today you're ready to say, God, I surrender it to you. And I'm gonna say instead, God be glorified. Would you raise your hand? Say, God be glorified in my situation. God be glorified in my circumstance. God, somehow manifest your presence and your power. All kinds of hands going up. Anybody else, if that's you, would you just raise your hand? Say, God, be glorified. I'm not going to blame me or blame somebody else today. I'm not going to look for who's to blame. God, I'm just asking you to take action in my circumstance. Just take action in this situation, God. 
And I want to just encourage you to begin to just call on the name of God with your hand lifted up, saying, God, work in my circumstance right here. Begin to name that thing out. Say, God, work in my body, work in my finances. God, work in my family. Whatever the stuff is that you're going through right now, God, we ask that you would be glorified in the circumstances of your people, God. Lord, I don't know why things have happened. I don't understand why you've allowed it to happen, but we're here. And so, God, if we're going to be here, I'm asking you to be glorified and walk me through this, God. God, take me through this gently like the good shepherd that you are, God. God, begin to walk me through this and help me to understand how you're doing this. And in the places I don't understand and I have no understanding, God, let me acknowledge you, God. Let me trust you in the midst of it. And Lord, I pray that you administer to your people today. Help us, God, to surrender the burden that we've been bearing under, wondering if we've done something wrong. We've kind of condemned ourselves or others because of it, God. We release that today. And I say, God, be glorified in the situation. Lord, let us count it all joy. Let us find a way, God, to see your hand at work in it. And even when we don't see your hand at work, God, let us trust your heart because your heart is always for us. Lord, I don't know what your people are facing, but I see so many hands up here today. I am confident of one thing, that there is faith being stirred up here. There is hope being stirred up within us. There's expectation, and I pray, God, that you would not allow us to surrender that in the heat of the battle. God, don't let us give up on trusting you. God, don't let us give up on the faith that you are working and that you are on the scene, God. Let us know that you are in control. And Lord, we don't always see or understand how, but you are. And I pray today, God, that you would let faith be stirred up in us in such a way that the enemy will not be able to steal it away. We bind the enemy today and we stand against him in the authority of Jesus Christ, that his weaponry has no victory over us because we fight this battle with godly, armament God and we thank you today that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal and they're not done in ways that we fight with our natural man but we fight these battles in the name of Jesus today God we ask that you would go before us in the name of Jesus and God that you would help us Lord to see the enemy defeated at your hand God at your voice at your way father and God that you would restore things God, you tell us in your word that you can restore back the years the canker worm has eaten away. God, restore hope and restore joy. Restore peace in the name of Jesus. Give your blessing, I pray, to your people today. And God, that we would go into the enemy's camp and take back the very things that he's stolen from us. That hope and joy and expectation, that belief that God is bigger than all things, that the enemy has tried to deteriorate because we've gone through things and we've lost our hope. God, I pray you restore that back into the body of Christ today and let us stand as a mighty army of God like we have not stood before in a long time. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would minister, God. And even when we don't see your hand at work, God, even when we don't sense the stirring of what you're doing, I pray, God, that we would trust you and wait. God, that we'd be willing to wait even when we don't hear the trumpet or the revelry, God, we haven't heard taps either. God, let us trust and hope in you in the meantime. Because God, you are working out all things for good to those who love you and those who are called according to your purpose. I pray God today we lay those burdens down and not carry them out with us here today. We surrender it in the name of Jesus.